Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, everyone. This is Nature of Reality Radio on May 13th, 2015. This is your host, Andrew Fisher, broadcasting every Wednesday from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. On the show today, I will be seeing, hearing from Rob Dew again. I don't know if he remembers me, but uh, I got to eat dinner with him and the rest of the Infowars gang in Dallas on the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination after we got assaulted by uh, federalized sheriff deputies that day. My God, that was a pain in the ass to remember. I guess we'll talk about that, among other things, on the show. Um, We'll be talking about current events news as well as general truth movement stuff. Area code 661 in the queue here. Rob Dew, if that is you, I'm glad to see you on. I will uh, get you on at no later than 10 after the hour. But first, we will start with the news, and how fittingly the news, as always, will be courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. First article, Economist, ban cash and force everyone to have a government-controlled bank account. National newspaper features brazen call for economic fascism. Yes, ban cash, for which for which there would be fundamental implications for freedom. If you cannot use cash as a backup, then you're in a lot of trouble. Cash is being demonized in so many ways. Let it be known that money laundering laws were never designed to... Um, catch criminals and whatnot. They were designed to harass everyday people like you and me in regards to how we use our money while all the um, higher-ups in government and the New World Order get to do whatever they want with it. Well, actually, even if they um, do ban cash, they wouldn't ban cash entirely. They would still need cash to uh, have an illegal underground market for certain things, but you would have to go through all sorts of invasive procedures to uh, get whatever cash there is. But But they do want a global currency now, uh, word on the street is, among some whistleblowers like Karen Hughes, the World Bank whistleblower, that um, there is a plan to make a gold-backed currency, crash the dollar, and make a global gold-backed currency. And um, Benjamin Fulford's Dragon Society, the word on the street is they're in on this. And uh, I have said before that I get weekly emails from um, ET contactee Sheldon Nidal, who says beyond, behind the scenes there are ETs out there who are uh, keeping a close eye on the powers that be and keeping them in check and locking them up and doing mass arrests and whatnot to uh, to make sure this gold back currency happens. Now, folks, I don't want you to all get your hopes up and think, oh, the aliens are going to come and save us and all that. No, we all have to do our part in everything. And uh, if you all sit back and uh, let it happen, then, well, it's not going to happen. So everybody do what you got to do. Use your money wisely. And uh, hopefully if everybody realizes that fractional reserve banking, which makes debt and inflation unavoidable because they loan us money that doesn't exist and charge us interest on it, um, that is not going to work out. Everybody has to realize that. Well, then the sooner everybody realizes that, the sooner we can uh, go to gold back currency and hopefully um, no currency whatsoever. But uh, next article, federal bill will require all public school students be vaccinated. Vaccinate All Children Act does not contain exemptions for reasons of conscience or religion. Yes, um The government does not have authority to force us to get vaccinations. So tell that to the government of Australia. Yes, Australia recently uh, is doing whatever it can to make everyone get vaccinated. I mean, such a law is not a law. It's a public policy. There is a difference between what is law and uh, what is considered to be public policy. And uh, this so-called Vaccinate All Children Act. I wonder who the uh, senators or representatives are who want to get that involved. No doubt they're New World Order minions. Love to kick them in the nuts for trying to pass this. Okay, next article. Elderly couple. um, First of all, before I um, get into anything more, check out my interview with uh, Leslie Mnookin. If anybody wants to uh, learn about um, vaccines in great detail, uh, she's done many uh, interviews on Infowars, and I did a a show with her as well. So you folks are more than welcome to check that one out. Next article. Elderly couple honk at off-duty cop. Cop breaks man's nose, smashes teeth out with gun. Uniformed officers arrive and laughed and joked with attacker. Um, Okay, uh, police brutality. There's a lot of reasons why cops are jerks. One, they, uh, well, the B want to make sure that cops with low IQs uh, get hired and uh, cops that are jerks get hired, just like uh, the TSA is trying to hire uh, criminals on purpose as one TSA whistleblower called into the Alex Jones show once not that long ago and uh, from a Rhode Island airport and uh, said that the TSA is trying to hire the worst of the worst scum. Likewise, cops are trying to hire the worst of the worst scum. And uh, 
a lot of the uh, stuff that police wear, I recommend people check out Mark Passio's presentation up, um, Occult Mockery of Police and Military Personnel, which he gave at the 2011 Free Your Mind Conference, talking about how the symbolism and such that cops wear, the, the color of the uniforms, the badges, the logos, the symbols, it uh, affects them at a, at a subconscious level. Every uh, symbol, they have some sort of a meaning, and that meaning can affect you at a subconscious, subliminal level, which um, if it's in a negative way, a negative symbol, it can make you, um, well, no symbol is negative. It's just the way the powers that be have construed the symbol for their own purposes. That symbol, can, simply because police wear them, it can make them act horribly like uh, some um, cops on their hats. They have a uh, pentagram, symbol for Satan, That's uh, and that will suppress the third eye of the pineal gland and make them act in a uh, in horrible ways and the color blue uh, the color blue is uh shows um subservience like the cops are servants to their masters who view them as nothing more than guard dogs and view the common people as cattle and uh the police i mean if they were wearing green uniforms which is a color of balance they probably wouldn't be acting so horribly but um i don't know what symbols or such this cop was wearing but he was probably just a jerk and that's why he broke this guy's nose and smashed his teeth out with a gun but new uh, new law, new excuse me, uh, new art. Next article here: New UK law could criminalize politically incorrect opinions. <laughs> so much for free speech. Uh, BBC criticism of feminism, homosexuality may be characterized as extremist. Yes, uh, freedom of speech does not give you the right to say hurtful things about people. You don't have the right to say things that harm other people. They're there are ways to harm people other than physically harming them, and speech is such a way. Like you don't, you don't have the right to use speech in a negligent or disruptive manner, and uh, such would be the case as racism is such. But simply um, criticizing people, be, um, just expressing your opinions, now that is definitely not something that um, freedom of, that would violate freedom of speech. And uh, I mean, your rights are inalienable. So even though the UK, well, I mean, they have like a constitution like we do that um has rights and all that but that that like our bill of rights only states rights you already have and uh so this is absolutely absurd no law is valid if it requires you in any way to waive any funda fundamentally protected right and no law can convert the free exercise of any right owner crime so these those folks in the uk you uh, should be really pissed off at this this law as they say in the british isles it's all a bunch of bollocks and shite all right, next article. IRS steals over 100000 from small businessmen in North Carolina. A uh, man was not charged with a crime. Don't have time to get into the, the details on this. Um, I guess maybe when, when Rob gets on, if he wants to talk about some of these articles I'm going over here in great detail, that's up to him. But uh, this show, it's not really so much of a news show as much as it is a um, show to get, expose the nature of reality. But hey, Rob's specialty is news, so I'll give let him treat the show as an exception to cover some important news current events news things for the purposes of this show and maybe this article will be one of those things it's up to him i'll let him know what he when he gets on whether or not he wants to do that but next article this is a red linked article special forces train with cops for house to house raids south carolina residents warn they may encounter military vehicles yes uh kind of reminds you of the uh boston bombing yeah if anybody wants to learn about the boston bombing and how it was a fraud uh Check out what was before this interview, my one and only interview with the uh, InfoWars reporter, which was my interview with Dan Badandi. He talks about how uh, the Boston bombing was a complete and total fraud, and um, we all know what happened after th he uh, exposed the Boston bombing for the fraud that it was, shutting down those press conferences. The police and the military, they went house to house, door to door, uh, knocked on people's doors, and were threatened to bust in if they didn't open the door so much for the Fourth Amendment. I mean, if the police knock on your door and they don't have a warrant, you have the right to refuse to let them in your house. But won't the police bash down my door? <laughs> Can't guarantee you that they won't, but always exercise your rights. The issue of whether or not you're hiding something is beside the point. You have the right to refuse to cooperate with law enforcement unless they um, show you probable cause that they're hiding something. If they don't show it to you, then, well, well, if they do show you a warrant, then, well, you got to cooperate them with, the, with them. But if they don't show you probable, a, proper, a warrant that's backed by probable cause – then you got the right to refuse. And in this day and age where rights are being taken away, you better refuse to cooperate with them. All right, two more articles, and then we'll get to Rob Du. Bombshell, Jade Helm, Propaganda Exposed, but what's next for America? I don't think I'm going to talk about much of this. Because I'll let Rob Du talk all about Jade Helm when I let him on. Uh, next art article is also about uh, Jade Helm. It says, document, Jade Helm commander plans to operationalize the CONUS base. 
a military is seeking to gain a full spectrum picture of the everyday lives of their adversaries. Yeah, well, I'll let, uh, I guess, Rob talk about this in uh, greater detail when I let him on, but let me make sure this is him. Uh, area code 661, is this Rob Dew? Hey, this is Rob Dew. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I Hello? can. Great to great All to be right. speaking to you again. Uh, I must say I enjoyed getting assaulted by those um, federalized police down in Dallas, and uh, it was a privilege to be able to eat with you and the rest of the InfoWars gang that day. Um, by the way, out of curiosity, did Alex Jones ever file a lawsuit against the uh, police and the feds for that incident, and how's it going if he did? As far as I know, he didn't. Um, I think – you know, something else probably hit the the burner at that point. But he was – we were all very mad that day, and uh, it was quite a relief. I remember we got back to to eat. We were eating in that kind of entryway to the to the bar, that landing, and we decided to – we needed more seating. And a couple of us went and picked up a, a couch and brought it over, and the security just had a fit that we were doing that and uh, got in my face and – said, you need to move that back. And I put it down at their feet and I said, listen, I've been messed with by cops and security guard goons the entire day. I'm not doing anything for you, buddy. So you could take it back. And uh, just one of those little incidents where, you know, we're there probably tripling their business at the time. And, uh, it, you know, you're, we're still getting messed with. I could, I could just see their faces at that. I forget the name of the hotel we were at, but it was right around the corner from where the uh, protests were going on, and uh, but that was quite a day. It was quite quite a day. It showed, I think, it showed a lot of people what the Infowars crew is made of. We sat out there in the rain along with our supporters and all the other people that wanted to protest and have free speech that were denied the ability to go into that location and just speak our mind when you know every other day you're allowed to do that. So uh, I think it was great that we put a show of force and we didn't let their show go on as planned. And, uh, and then we showed them the kind of the brutes that they are. I mean, total, total brutality done by the sheriff's office. Totally. And um, by the way, whenever I have someone on my show who's been hassled and harassed by law enforcement, the government or the powers that be for exercising their rights or doing things that they, the powers that be don't want people doing, I give them, I always give them the chance to talk about their misfortunes. Uh, you were arrested um, for exercising your right to uh, free press at the um, G20 summit in Pittsburgh back in, uh, I think it was 2010 or was it 2011? It was, uh, well, whatever it was, it was. Uh, uh, it was actually September 29th, 2009 is when I was arrested. And, all right, why uh, don't I remember you tell that. Us because, all, tell us oh, all yeah, about that. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, um, I had been there for several days already covering the G20 and what was going on, and the G20 ended the day before. And we were leaving the next day, and we got wind of a uh, – I think Jason Burmis got a text that there was a protest, an anti-police brutality protest going on at Pitt campus, which if you look on a map, um, there, Pittsburgh kind of goes into a point. Everything having to do with the G20 was happening down at that point, and Pitt campus is about two miles away from that area, so not even in the same area as the G20. There was uh, 50 people in uh, a little park right across the street from the Cathedral of Learning, and they were protesting. And I got the text, and I was actually out. I actually lived in Pittsburgh for about eight years. I finished high school up there. So I was uh, taking the evening, and uh, I was having dinner with a couple of friends, and I got a text from Burmis, who had gone down there. I said, you know, text me if it's if it's big, and I'll, I'll be there with my camera. And uh, he, he goes, you, you got to get down here now. You're not going to believe it. So I actually brought one of my friends who, who didn't believe it either. He's, uh, <laughs> I drove him down there. I said, you're not going to believe this. And we get there, and there's probably, I don't know, 200 riot cops at that point. Full battle gear, their Darth Vader stormtrooper outfits, the, the shields, and they're surrounding the park. And as probably over the next hour or two hours, more cops show up. And I, I would I – would, estimate probably 1,500 riot cops on the scene by the end, and full riot gear for 50 people. They shot tear gas into the park. Uh, most of the people left before they did that, and and then by that time, students are walking around. They go, man, what's going on? You know, So rubbernecking, they start clearing, uh, coming into the area, looking around to see what's going on. Well, the cops didn't like that. At one point, they were uh, beating their shields like a Roman phalanx, uh, moving forward. And all this, I was shooting all this video. I had my press pass on the whole time. I actually went up to one of the uh, local news vans, and I said, hey, uh, you, you know, are they going to 
have they said anything to you guys yet? Because they haven't said anything to me about having to leave. They're like, no, we haven't got anything. I th- he goes, you'll be all right with your press pass. I said, all right. And uh, so we're filming this stuff, and they start doing these maneuvers where they're closing in on people, and they start shooting more tear gas. And I ended up at the top of the hill um, right next to the cathedral learning, probably with about 30 or 40 other people, most of which were students, uh, one of which was Luke Radowski, and um, – and a couple others that were out there protesting slash alternative media. And uh, at that point, they had us surrounded. I was still shooting. I did not stop shooting at any point. I kept my camera rolling. And I walked up to the security guard, all of which is on tape, and all of which is out on the the Internet somewhere. You can find it. And um, I said, I'm I'm with the press, and, you know, can I get through this line? Because I had had watched another reporter walk up. It was a little Asian girl. And she walked up, had a little pad. She wasn't even filming. She was just a reporter. And they let her through. So I said, all right, they're going to let press out. And uh, it sucks to be these guys. And uh, the rest of the people that were on the ground with their hands behind their backs. And so I walk up. The guy says, you're with the press. I said, yeah. And he goes, you know, you got to leave the area. I said, that's fine. I'll leave. And um, as I was walking out, another female cop comes up. She had a full gas mask on, so I couldn't really tell it was a female until I listened to the footage later. And she grabs my press pass. And at which point, I guess she saw it was InfoWars and free speech systems and goes, no, no, he's not with the press. He's not with the press. And immediately they said, down on your knees, sir, for your own protection. Uh, I got down on my knees. Um, I kept the camera rolling. They uh, handcuffed me uh, with zip ties and then walked me through, you know, a crowd of police officers, put me down in this one area for a while. And then uh, I got onto a bus and they took me over to, uh, which is a defunct installation i guess it used to be a small jail on on the other side of the one of the three rivers on the north side of pittsburgh and we were there for about 10 hours we got out the next day and uh i just remember being surreal it was pretty cold it got cold that night i was wearing shorts during the day because it was pretty hot and we'd been following a march walking down from Pitt all the way down and see, they let the protesters protest all day That was the crazy thing. And then it's just that this one section at night after the G20 is over, well, now you're not allowed to protest. So just being under the thumb of the police state and uh, with the help of Stuart Rhodes, actually uh, almost two years later uh, that summer, he said, why don't you file a lawsuit? They violated your First Amendment rights. I said, I know, but, you know, I don't don't want to be that guy that does lawsuits. He's like, no, come on, let's do it. So – um, with his help, we uh, ended up filing a lawsuit, and the uh, the state or the city of Pittsburgh uh, settled out of court. And that's pretty much all I'm allowed to say because all the rest was out before then. But due to the terms and conditions of the settlement, that's uh, that's what I'm allowed to say. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, I guess we'll um, start talking about some important news issues going on uh, at the present time. There's a lot of talk about the whole. Jade Helm thing. I believe um, it's supposed to become official um, in September. Um, I've been watching a lot of videos by this uh, guy named Mr. Katai. That's his alias. He uh, looks at a lot of codes and such, and he's been doing a lot of uh, code research on things like Google Doodles and such, and it seems like Jade Helm always pops up um, in the codes and also um, the date September 24th because the word on the street is there's supposed to be an asteroid that's supposed to hit the Atlantic Ocean on uh, around September 24th. And coincidentally, that's the same time period as that um, Shemitah thing. There was that interview that Leon McAdoo recently did with um, some rabbi, uh, Jonathan Kahn, yeah, that was his name, who talked about mm-hmm. how a super Shemitah prophecy is supposed to be fulfilled this upcoming September. And coincidentally, it's around the same time as the um, Jade Helm thing is supposed to um, start, which I think is around September 15th, and then there, the word on the street is that asteroid is alleged to hit in the Atlantic Ocean on uh, uh, the 24th of September, and also uh, the Pope is uh, going to be visiting America around that time period, and he's going to be visiting Philadelphia on the uh, 26th and the 27th. I do plan on organizing a rally to uh, protest his appearance and expose the Vatican as a satanic cult, which masquerades as a Catholic organization, but um, th- that's a side issue. The point is, uh, Jade Helm and everything that goes with it. Um, I'll give you the floor to talk about anything and everything you know about Jade Helm. Well, before we get into the seriousness of that, I do want to point out that that interview that Liam McAdoo did with with uh, the author. If you uh, if you're into drinking games, it's all you could you could take a drink every time that man says Shmita, and uh, you will be 
clearly liquored up by the end. But um, now let's get into the real story. I guess I think Jade Helm starts in June, and it will be going until September. That's when it's supposed to end. And um, that is why a lot of people are up in arms for the length that this exercise is going on and the federal government's propensity to have operations and exercises going on when real-time events happen. Um, one I thought it was very interesting yesterday – C-SPAN had a, a writer for the Washington Post on talking about Jade Helm, and he, he was the national security writer, and he says, ah, there's really nothing to worry about. Don, uh, what's his name? Dan Lamont is his name, and he you know, writes for the Washington Post, so he's being funded by giant drug companies and, um, and other Orwellian types of businesses that want to keep you uh, dumbed down and stupid. So his job is to keep you dumbed down and stupid because that's what his bosses want, and so, but it was interesting when they let the callers in, and the callers, half of them were for, um, were thinking Jade Helm's no big deal, and that if people criticizing the exercise are just racist against Obama, because that's the tactic they've been trained to use. That if you don't agree with President Obama, you're a racist. Yet, if you don't agree with President Bush, what are you? You know, are you an anti-Texist, or or whatever? But one of the callers brought up an interesting point that they were running. There was an exercise running the. It was supposed to run the day after President Reagan was shot, and it was a FEMA exercise, and it was titled uh, Nine Lives, and it was a, a presidential succession drill that they were going to run. Uh, and I, I don't know what the coincidence would be that you're going to run a presidential succession drill uh, right at the time that the president is being shot, and he's the first president that had been shot since JFK. So I don't know what the odds are about that. And then he asked the guys, well, have you heard about the drills they were running during 9-11? And both of these guys go. Well, the the host goes. Where do you get your news from? And he mentions the Lester Tarpley book, Synthetic Terror. But it, it's not. They don't even. Then they don't even entertain his questions. They just go on to the next caller. So they just dismiss the fact that Vigilant Guardian was being run at the same time by NORAD, and there was a reason why there was no air security. Um, being activated because pe some people thought it was a drill. In fact, you can find audio recordings uh, from the air traffic controllers, and at one point somebody says, is this part of the drill? So they admit there uh, in real time that there's a drill being run, and they, were, they weren't sure what was going on, which is how they cloud these events. Um, you could go to the Boston bombing, and I imagine those two guys, the older brother was probably – uh, some sort of an agent. We don't know for sure. His his uncle had some CIA ties. He had some ties going back to Chechnya. And he probably recruited his little brother. And at some point, they were going to be part of an exercise. Because if you notice, uh, when they started talking about black backpacks, a lot of hackers got on and released a bunch of photos of about 30, 40 people carrying black backpacks in the area. So it's really hard to say that the kid wearing the gray backpack <laughs> was the one carrying the bomb. Uh, but that sort of evidence never got entered in uh, to the trial, I'm sure, because the lawyer came out and said, well, he did it. And uh, maybe he did do it. We'll never know. One thing's for sure, the Boston Globe put out a tweet four minutes after it happened that officials were um, going to uh, detonate an explosive that they had found at the library. And among other things, there was also a runner at the starting line who noticed bomb-sniffing dogs, and there was loudspeakers saying that there was a drill going on. But none of that ever makes it into the, the mainstream media narrative. Uh, the only thing that makes it is Dan Badandi asking those questions, and they can you know, take Dan Badandi and go, oh, we're going to ridicule this guy. He's a tinfoil hat-wearing conspiracy theorist, when in fact he was an asking real questions. I also think it's funny that the governor, when asked if it was a false flag drill, says no. The same answer is given when we ask Jeb Bush's people if he's going to be going to Bilderberg, a one-word answer, no. The same thing uh, if Jade Helm is being taken over, uh, is going to be used to take over Texas when they ask, I think it's Michael Morrell, they ask him that and he goes, no. They don't add any explanation or anything. It's just, no, don't ask me these types of questions anymore. These are not worthy questions. You're not part of the mainstream media press. How could you dare ask anything like that? But uh, the big thing I think about Jade Helm, and, and feel free to jump in, Andrew, at any time, um, but I've been doing a lot of research on Jade Helm, and it, it doesn't seem to be I, – I think it is an exercise, but it's an exercise more than just the military walking around the woods. I think what they are doing is running a, a, a PSYOP on the American people to put it out there to see who responds to it and how they respond. And what they are doing is they've been running a program through geointelligence is what they call it, geoint, 
And um, they've been running these things for at least the past five years now that we have the cloud computing and all this real-time stuff that these little hand gadgets can access. And it's to find out who's friendly and who's not friendly in certain areas as, say, your special forces are in Bastrop. Well, they could pull up a map, and based on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and anything else that's been put out there that's attached to your name, which is why you have your one Google ID that goes into all these different places, well, they can match, are you a friendly, are you an adversary in real time? They can make those calculations. So I think this is part, this, everything that we're involved in, even us talking about it now, I think is part of the exercise it's kind of like let the Tasmanian devil out and see what happens, kind of what they did with ISIS. They're not actually controlling ISIS now, but, you know, they're giving them weapons, they're funding them, they're just letting them go wild. So I think that's what we're in the midst of is all – this is all part of a PSYOP, and it's to real-time document who's going to be friendly and who's not. And I think it's great that a lot of people stood up in Bastrop when they had that, that meeting, that second meeting, uh, after people knew what was going on. And um, incidentally, I talked about this last night when I was on the nightly news that it was a veteran who sent that the email slides to me, sent me an email and said, hey, check out these slides. I looked at it. Immediately, my spidey sense went off. I printed it out. I brought it over to Joe Biggs. I'm like, hey, you're in the military. What does all this jargon mean? He goes, oh, man, they've got – look at this map. They're labeling Texas as hostile, mastering the human domain. This is something I've heard about. But the mastering of the human domain didn't really hit us till a couple weeks later. Uh, in fact, it was David Knight and I that started going over this stuff, and we did a really long presentation. You can find that on YouTube. It's called Jade Helm is for the American People. And we kind of tie in all this mastering of the human domain geo-intelligence, really boring, kind of watching paint dry presentations um, that the military does. And that's why this stuff never gets out in the open because it's so boring. People can't stand to watch it. I can barely stand to watch it, but it was interesting to analyze it and put it out there and then, you know, let the people decide this is what's going on. This is what our government's doing. This isn't the troops. This has nothing to do with the troops. These are the people who write the orders for the troops. And this is what they're thinking. So let's get in their mind and see what they're up to, and then we can make, I think, informed decisions and not go, oh, I'm against the troops. I'm questioning the troops like you know, Rick Perry says we're not allowed to question the troops. I don't think we're questioning the troops. We're questioning the people that are beyond troop level, the ones that are writing the orders for the troops, the ones that are coming up with these giant philosophies that are then turned into operational procedures. Thank you. And there's been a lot of talk about the Walmart closures recently. Uh, some people have, uh, well, many say the whole thing about plumbing issues is one great big lie. But um, it has been said that the Walmarts, they are actually designed to be uh, FEMA camps of sorts. And uh, well, some say that's, a, um, that's, not, that's not true. There's other purposes behind that. That's just a conspiracy theory, if you will. So uh, do you have an idea what, what the deal is with all these Walmart closures that have been going on recently? Well, I've heard and I've read a lot of emails from people at different Walmarts. Of, uh, there's a guy in a Las Vegas Walmart uh, that sent a really interesting video where he goes in and he goes, look, they, now, they're, now they're, this Walmart is open 24 hours a day. Look at the parking lot. It's filled with cars. It's always busy here. I've lived here for 15 years. And then he goes inside. I wish I could remember the name of the video, but I've seen so much since then. But his really stuck out in my mind because of just the way it was about a five-minute video that he produced. It wasn't one of these 50-minute things that you have to sit through. You can, you can kind of get the gestalt really quickly. But he goes in. He's showing that now the uh, shelves have been designed to roll around, which wasn't like that before. He asks the guy inside the store. The guy says, I don't want to be taped. And then he goes outside and talks to an employee and says, hey, you know, what's the deal? Why is the Walmart closing at night? And he said, yeah, we just started doing that. And he goes, what about the, the, the uh, shelves? Why are they being allowed to – change to roll around. He goes, yeah, that's new too. So he's admitting to all this stuff, and he, but he doesn't know why it's being done like that. And the guy says, you know, go check out Jade Helm. Um, and then you have other, uh, you know, I've been getting a lot of intel from people. Uh, I get a lot of emails, several from a Walmart in, I believe it's Livingston, which was one of the ones that closed, and it was on that list of the, the plumbing issues where they, they kind of fired everybody the day before or laid them off, essentially. Um before they made the announcement, and then it was the plumbing issues. And I, I got several, a couple emails from different people and saying, hey, we saw military activity there. I said, send me a picture, and I'll get a crew there immediately. All I need is a picture that shows it, and they can never give me a picture. Um, and then I actually found some local 
media in the area who do like these community type newsletters. I contacted two different ones. One got back with me the next day and said, there's definitely not anything going on military wise. There's a crew there cleaning out the store. And then another, the other guy didn't respond to me. So uh, there's video that I saw last night. Uh, I, I forget. I think it's Professor Doom. That I'm, I don't want to say his name wrong, but he had, was showing some video of uh, a truck with a couple Humvees on it, and it looked like it was pulling in to a Walmart parking lot. But, you know, one thing we got to keep in mind, and believe me, I would love to say Walmart is part of the evil conspiracy, and they probably are. And I, I guarantee you in times of crisis, the, the Walmart's going to be one of the first companies to work with the government to do whatever the government says. Um, but it, back in when Katrina happened, Walmart sent a bunch of water to help people out, and Katrina and FEMA turned it away. So maybe that relationship has changed since then. And also, truckers and RVers, it's well known that Walmart is a good place, a safe place for you to go park your car because it's 24-hour type security, and um, and they don't care uh, because, you know, you're a customer, essentially. They know you're going to come in and buy some stuff. So, you know, but I've also got an email, and I've got some photos that I haven't even sent to the writers yet that I kind of wanted to vet of giant MRAPs sitting on ships. And I said, well, how can how do you know they're coming inbound? How do you know they're not going outbound? Because they're in the tes- desert tan color. And he's like, I'm not sure yet, but I'll, I'm monitoring it. And he sent me some great photos, and there's a barge with at least 300 MRAPs on it, the big ones, the kind that we saw out in Spokane that that look like giant tanks. So, you know, do I do I think that there's underground tunnels? I think there's underground tunnels in in this country, yeah. But I, I don't know if Walmart's connected to it. I haven't seen the uh the bodies yet as they say it's kind of like with uh david ike talking about the uh, reptilians you know just someone catch one and show me the reptilian even if it's a bad grainy youtube video i just want to see it for myself but i don't discount it right right uh since i mentioned the uh fema camps and how they might tie into walmart uh I suppose you might as well spend a little time talking about uh, those camps. I know all about how uh, several Infowars uh, uh, people decided to quit their jobs because they got harassed by people after the um, Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura episode aired, exposing the uh, FEMA camps. It was a police state episode. That episode only aired once, and um, people were uh, threatened, and uh, the show was told never to air again on on True TV, and people had it... um, deleted from their um, recording devices and such. Um, Alex has often said he's not allowed to um, talk about it in detail because he was told things in confidence and out of respect. Um, don't, don't say any of the stuff that he was told in confidence by all, by all means. But uh, the interesting thing is you guys in um, around mid-2012 received leaked documents. They weren't classified. Uh, they were just about as close to being classified without actually being classified, which um, talked about... Uh, uh, the documents were dated from 2010. It said um, uh, that it was a red-linked article on uh, Infowars.com saying something like um, plans for re-educa- re-education centers in America, something to that effect. And even though the words FEMA camps weren't mentioned in the article, it was uh, talking about the FEMA camps um, in general. And Alex Jones did say that was the uh, probably the biggest story he's ever done since uh, since 9-11. There's also been the word on the street that the um, vaccines are uh, going to be used, uh, like, excuse me, not vaccines, um, some sort of a pandemic of some disease would be used to uh, put people in the FEMA camps. That was in the conspiracy theory with Jesse Ventura episode. And they would use uh, vaccines to poison everybody, to make everybody sick, to make more people get locked up in the FEMA camps. So um, I guess I'll give you the floor to talk about anything and everything that you guys at InfoWars have learned about the FEMA camps and what they're going to be used for, what their plan, what the plan is to use them for. Not that they will make those plans come to fruition or anything. Yeah, well, I mean, that is a broad, broad issue. And I think it, it kind of starts off with, you know, continuity of government back in the 80s with, you know, Ali North and then moving into the civilian in, inmate labor camp program, which you can read. In fact, if you go on break, I'll go grab the uh, the book that Alex wrote about it. Initially, it appeared on the Internet as one page, and there's an officer down there that you can contact but it just talks about that they have, you know, seven or eight camps already in operation, and they are civilians, uh, civilian prisons, but they are being run by the military, and they are being used to go do work on military bases. And this is they're talking about how the how much money they're 
being saved by doing this. So, and then that morphs into the plan to, uh, there was the uh, Emergency Centers Establishment Act, which I don't believe was passed, but it was to set up a bunch of emergency centers across the country to handle several million people. And then the documents that you're referring to, uh, Paul Joseph Watson wrote some pretty amazing articles just detailing and going into them and how people were saying, oh, this isn't for America. This is set up somewhere else. And no, it's for America. It's talking about using people's social security numbers to uh, categorize them. It also talks about using PSYOP officers in there to keep, well, you know, I guess the PSYOP officers are in charge of picking the movies out um, when you're locked up in the FEMA camp. And, you know, they're not going to say, uh, it, it, I liken it to this. When, when the Nazis were loading Jews up on trains, they weren't telling them, hey, we're going to take you over here and kill you. They were saying, we're moving you to a new location. And then they, after the train stopped, they said, put all your clothes here and, and go hit the showers. You guys stink. And then they gassed them. You know, at no point did they say, we're going to kill you now, unless they were being lined up and shot in pits. But most of it was done in this very ordered fashion, and people didn't know they were being killed till the very last minute. So – you know, it's like Hillary says, we need to have fun camps for the adults to have more fun. Well, that's her euphemism to say, we're going to send you to these places, and you're not going to think – we're going to tell you it's for fun, or we're going to tell you it's for your safety, or we're going to tell you you're going to go get food or water here. Just go here. And, yeah, could they put something in the vaccines? Sure. I mean, that's why they have this new bill out to uh, – to vaccinate every child. And, and who knows, it'll start with children first and then the children will spread it to adults. I mean, there's so many things that they're working on in these bio labs and, and they're they're having stuff escape from bio labs through monkeys and all, all this stuff could happen. But the bottom line is the United States is ready for any incident like this in any army base, even the ones that have been defunct could be turned into a FEMA camp already. There are already secure locations. They could put people into areas. They could set up tents. They um, I, Even in, over in Fort Hood, I went and investigated where they were building a, a hospital, but the, the barbed wire perimeter around the hospital was all facing in, and this was inside the base. And we shot video of this, and incidentally, where they were building this hospital was right next to the train station, which is what you saw in Germany. Um, a lot of these places were right on rail lines. And this went right into uh, the base in uh, uh, Fort Hood. Is that the one in Colleen? I think that's Fort Hood. Yeah. So um, I, I, the, FEMA, the FEMA camp problem is like it's the giant elephant that uh, the mainstream media will never touch because I think it would they, it would panic too many people. And I you know I don't think a lot of people would really believe it unless they're around this information and can see how it's how the pieces get put together. So you may see one piece of it and not really think much of it, but when you're looking at it over a multi-year um, you know, drawn out timeline, you can start seeing how the pieces are being put together. And, you know, I've been probably listening to Alex Jones and reading about this stuff since the late nineties. Uh, but it was even before that I was into this stuff and I knew our government was crooked and you couldn't trust either side. It was, you know, the, both sides were on the same team, which is the team of, you know, who's going to give us the most money to tell us what to do because we're really imbeciles. And, and, you know, I was just looking up, you were mentioning that article about the lady, uh, the, the congresswoman who put the uh, vaccine bill together. I was trying to see if she was being funded by drug companies. Well, at, at least not drug companies, but she is funded by a hell of a lot of sugar companies out there. I saw at least five or six different uh, sugar plants or sugar organizations and teachers organizations that were funding her, but that's teacher and labor unions are pretty typical of Democrats. But, what I can't stand is, you know, the Democrats all claim to be for freedom of speech and free expression, but, you know, just don't speak out against vaccines because that's part of the collective good. So anything that has to do with being in that collective atmosphere, they are so for, and they want to demean you if you are against it. And if you start talking about it, they want to shame you into this stuff. And I've dealt with these people in the past, and, and they're pathetic, really, because they just don't want to take the time to look at the research because it's not – out there in plain view, there's a lot of people talking about it now, a lot more than before. Leslie Manukian, like you mentioned, she's a, a you know a really great person to to talk about this stuff, and she was you know in the system. She switched over, she changed sides because she saw what it was doing, and, and those are the people I think you know. John Perkins is another guy who was on that side of going in and taking out nations, and now he's 
speaking out against it now, albeit from a, probably a more of a, a liberal perspective than I am, but at least he's on the same side of, of freedom and liberty. So, but yeah, FEMA camps are real. Uh, you know, get used to it. I guess I should, that could be my final word on the FEMA camps. Well, or we could even talk about the AARP uh, subliminal ad that was what, – what did you think of that, how AARP put that subliminal ad that martial law is being declared as part of a pandemic and they have a whole ad system set up and they want to get you to uh, off ready.gov, um, you know, they want you to be prepared. Maybe you have to go to a mass care facility. See, they're not going to call it a FEMA camp. It's going to be called a mass care facility operated by a disaster relief group. Yeah, FEMA, a FEMA camp. I mean, that's what it is. But, you know, if it's snowing or raining, the FEMA camp will probably close down because we saw that happen during, I think it was Superstorm Sandy. Um, a couple of the FEMA locations were closed due to bad weather. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, there was one article that I went over in the um, news segment at the beginning of the show. I don't know if you've had time to look into it. This one here about the IRS stealing over 100000 from a small businessman in North Carolina. This is, this is kind of a inauspicious indeed. Well, I mean, the IRS could just arbitrarily steal money, this much money from anyone. Um, the IRS, of course, is a um, privately owned Puerto Rican trust fund. Uh, Google the phrase Puerto Rico trust fund number 62, and you'll learn all about that. But for the IRS to um, just do this to someone, and he wasn't even charged with a crime, it says in the sub article, um, have you looked into this article? Can you give us maybe the details on this and maybe give us some solutions as to how to make sure this doesn't happen to us? Well, you know, I, I think don't put your money in uh, in that large amount in a bank account for the government to steal would be my first advice. Although I'm not a financial advisor, um, but I think in if you're uh, if you're not rich like me, um, you know, owning silver is a way to do that. O- owning firearms, owning things people are going to need in uh, a time of crisis, I think is a smart thing to do. Owning land. Um, you know, doing those types of things. But I think when you put your money into these government systems, you're just asking for it to be stolen. And this guy, you know, uh, kind of a pot-bellied guy, looks like a good old boy American, and, uh, you know, probably believed in the system, probably watched a lot of Fox News. I mean, I'm just saying that outright. You know, I'm not saying that's bad that he's watching Fox News, but just he probably was – you know, kind of unaware of what's really going on in this world. And he just got um, slapped in the face by the the New World Order. And I think Ronald Reagan did a study, or he commissioned a study, and they said that none of the money ever goes to actually paying for roads or doing all the stuff they try to guilt you into paying your taxes for. It actually just goes to interest on the debt created by the Federal Reserve, which creates money out of thin air. So that, um, you know, that, that would be my best advice. Don't have money and stuff for them to take in, in, in those amounts. Have have your money in other types of uh, assets that can be used, um, you know, and that it, it, takes, it takes a lot more for, you know, the IRS could just go to a bank and, and request that money, boom, and it's gone. Um, it takes them a lot longer to come and steal your land or to steal your house or, you know, to find you if you're in your car, you know. And so I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have that much money lying around for the IRS to take in the first place. Thank you for the uh, the advice there. I'm sure some people will, um, will take note of it. Uh, by the way, you've been doing a lot of um, reports on vaccines recently. Um, like I said, I did interview Leslie Minukin. She talks about that in uh, great detail, vaccines, flu shots, and, and all the rest of it. There was one specific uh, story you did um, about uh, solutions where you uh, said we're trying to um, talk more about solutions now in regards to vaccines and how to prevent them and how to uh, – what what to do about them. Um, I mean, this would especially be critical in Australia where they've uh, passed public policy saying that everybody has to get vaccinated. Well, actually, why don't you enlighten everybody on on that whole in- thing going on in Australia with um, so-called mandatory vaccines and also what are some solutions, for lack of a better phrase, you have in regards to dealing with the vaccine crisis? It's a tough one um, because it, it, it does hit on so many societal levels, and the propaganda is just rampant at this point. But um, the prime minister of Australia doesn't give his daughters the uh, HPV shot, and I think that should say a lot. Dr. Oz has been on TV. Um, I think he was on CNN talking to Bar- – what's her name? I think her name's Brown. Uh, I forget her name, but – 
he uh, he said his the, his kids don't get the flu shot. So yet it's all it's all okay for us. Uh, there was a report that came out that the Germans get clean vaccines, and I, I'll tell you uh, one of the things I had to do, um, and in addition to educating my wife, I had to go toe to toe with my doctor um, because I was very anti-vaccination, and she, you know she's my wife's being told that you know she's for it or that she's for it. She's being sold the propaganda, and she's worried about whooping cough and these other things. And I brought in a stack of articles. Um, and just talk to my doctor calmly about each one. What about this? What about this? At the time, um, one of George Bush's, uh, I think she was the she's head of the CDC, I uh, forget her name out, but then she went to work for one of the big pharmaceutical companies in charge of their child vaccine division. I mean, that should, that should be against the law. That should, you know, how could you have somebody working in the government and then being able to go out and work in the private sector for the same thing. They've, they've established those contacts. They know how to get stuff through. They know how to fast track stuff. And, and just the amount of vaccines that they have, and, you know, my biggest advice is read the damn insert. And if you actually read the insert and you look up the terms you don't understand on a medical dictionary site, uh, anybody can have access to it. Um, you will think twice about giving your kids vaccines. I think probably most of the people listening to your show aren't, vaccinating their kids are are doing less than what they're supposed to but it's i I firmly believe it's a um a bio weapon attack to mainly debilitate kids to the point where they need big pharma for the rest of their life and i i was told that philosophy from sherry tenpenny who i went and interviewed up in uh, uh cleveland a few years ago and you know i think we were done shooting and i, I said why do you think you know, because kids, a lot, it's not too many kids die from vaccines. That's, that's true. But you have, unless you're the two kids in Mexico earlier this week, but, um, you know, a lot of kids get debilitated. You look at allergies, you look at all these other things, asthma, um, just muscular uh, dystrophy, just these different things that happen to kids that weren't that were rare back in the past. When I was growing up, it was rare to have anybody allergic to peanuts. I mean, I, I think I remember one kid who carried around a shot pack when it was for bee stings back in I, when I was in Boy Scout camp. And that was like weird because I'd never seen that before in my life. And now half of my kids' friends are allergic to peanuts. Well, there's a peanut antigen in one of these, uh, one of the vaccines. I don't know which one right offhand, but that's why these kids are getting peanut allergies because the your body thinks the peanut is a deadly disease it has been trained to think that so when it senses the peanut or the peanut butter it goes into overdrive and starts to attack it so um that's my, my biggest and we have to fight for our, our our conscientious objection to these vaccines i mean vermont just got rid of it the federal government's looking at getting rid of it and it, it's going to take people really standing up and pushing back at the government and um you know i'm i'm definitely at, at this point in my life, I'm, I feel I'm educated enough to know I've done more research. Uh, you've got these, uh, oh, there's this wicked exchange between Elizabeth Warren and someone from the CDC where she's asking these little boilerplate questions. How are vaccines safe? Yes, they're very safe and effective. Is there anything toxic in the vaccine? She goes, no. Well, there's some, a little bit of some things, but not in the amounts that are, are deadly. And it's just outright lying to the American people, and it makes me sick at my stomach that we are totally controlled, uh, our news media and, and those that should be objective are being you know, bought by giant pharmaceutical companies to roll out these vaccines, and they've got a lot more down the pipeline. It's, it's not just what they want to give kids now. And that's gone up since the 90s. You know, they, were, they increased the schedule a lot in the 90s, and now it's a lot more. Now, well, how about triple – of what it of what it is now, you know, we're all going to be walking around drooling, um, you know, a bunch of nincompoops if we continue down this road. But you always see the elites not having to do and take the same things that that they're forcing on us. Thank you, Rob. Uh, switching gears, um, get to have a little fun now. Um, pick on Alex Jones a little bit here. Uh, Hate to do this, but I just have to do it for the sake of one of my previous guests. John Nicholson, president of the Citizens Committee on uh, Restructured Government. 
He was on my show. He takes solutions very seriously. He told me that he tried to get on Alex Jones' radio show before. He said he was declined, and he asserts that the reason Alex will not let him on his show is because Alex is so obsessed with the publicity that he gets from fear-mongering that he does not want people like John Nicholson who obsess about solutions so much because he sees uh, sees people like that as a threat to his publicity. I hate to pick on Alex like this, but hey, if you don't want to talk about this, just say no comment. But do you have any response to John Nicholson's allegation there? Well, um, I honestly have, have never heard of John Nicholson um, I, I'll even, in fact, I'll do a search of my email right now, see if he even contacted me. What's the name of the group he's with? Citizens Committee for Restructured Government. All right. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that want to get on Alex's show because of how big it is, and it's it's a delicate balance, I guess, to get on, uh, you know, it, who knows how he may have come off and said, I demand to be on the show. I don't know. You know, um, I'm looking it up right now. So you even sent me an email. I have, by the way, I have a hundred thousand, a hundred uh, and seven thousand emails that I have not read um, in my inbox. So um, who knows how many I've read at this point in my uh, many years working for Alex since 2009. I don't, uh, I don't even anything for him you know i don't know a lot of people you know Al- alex is the way he is and it's his show and i think alex talks a lot about solutions and I-, I think as he's getting older and and seeing stuff i think he's getting more freaked out and getting overloaded but you know i'm not uh i'm not alex jones and you know i i work for him but i i'm not in his head and i don't know i do know this the the other day he told me he he looked at me and goes i think something big's about to happen so you know, if he's if he's fear mongering, I think it's because he really believes. And when I say fear mongering, I mean warning people like, "Hey, wake up!" I think Alex Jones is put here on this earth to wake people up, and after that, it's everybody else's job to come up with their best solution. And um, but I think that is the reason he was put here on this earth to wake our asses up and get us motivated to do something, because that's when I first turned him on the radio. I remember driving down the road and I'm listening to this guy and I had just read None Dare Call It Conspiracy and a book by Ralph Nader called Who Runs Congress. And uh, I'd read those in college about two months before. I had just moved to Austin. I turned on, I think it was 98.9 at the time. It was a talk radio station. It had Howard Stern on in the morning and then it went to a couple other people and G. Gordon Liddy and then and then this guy, Alex Jones. And man, when I heard him, I'm like, man, this this guy is for real. I can't believe he's on the air. I can't believe people are letting him talk like this because I didn't think the things that he were saying that he was saying were possible to get out on the air like that. But he did it his own way by starting his own access show, by becoming his own leader and developing his own system, which I think you have to respect more than anything. Everything here, uh, he did it without going out and getting loans and, and having somebody on top of him all the time. He did it all by himself, and he's got a major – operation running here and i'm very proud to uh be part of it and to be working with him in that capacity to wake people up now i don't know about john nicholson i'm looking through my emails still right now and i don't even see an email from him i'm sure he's probably listening now and will send me like 10 emails um uh put hey rob in the subject line if you do do that i always look for those and anytime i'm uh if anybody wants to send me an email my email is robd at infowars.com, and uh, please put Hey Rob in the subject line if you want me uh, to see it, because I do. I have uh, 107,023 emails that I have not read. And I can't. I don't even read all the ones that I get every day. There's, it's just impo- it's an impossible task. But I do look at the uh, subject line and see what people are saying in that subject line, or if it's somebody I know personally, I'll check that out. Um, so, you know, I can't really answer uh, answer you correctly, I guess, on John Nicholson. But, you know, um, e- even if I didn't work for Alex Jones, I would be uh, a big supporter of Alex Jones because of the, what I think he's doing. And, you know, when you get this big, sometimes people get rubbed the wrong way. But I've never seen Alex go out and attack somebody, like attack them unless they attacked him first. Uh, I could swear in a Bible saying that. And... um you know, 
I don't know if I would swear in a Vatican Bible, though. <laughs> Because the Vatican, like I said, is uh, satanic. But, um, hey, if you guys want to come up and cover the Pope's appearance in uh, Philadelphia on the 26th and the 27th of September, that great. that would be great. I definitely plan on being there to to protest uh, his appearance. So, so you're, um, you're, you're in Philly now. What What is the latest word on this Amtrak derailment? I mean, aside from the just crumbling infrastructure we have in this country, and uh, but they say that the train was going up to 100 miles an hour. That was the last thing I read. Did they um, were they able to find the black box? Did it did it disappear? I just heard about some people discussing it at work today. I don't know all the uh, details on it, but I know what you're talking about. My uncle was on that um, rail line not that long ago. It's a good thing he wasn't on the wrong train. But um, yeah, I, um, good luck researching that. I hope we'll get some answers on that soon. So, uh, by the way, um, since I mentioned um, positive things, solutions, I do remember you saying on a recent episode of uh, InfoWars Nightly News that um, Alex Jones does want to talk about more positive things. I think that's just a manifestation of uh, the uh, truth vibrations and such um, happening on this planet. I mean, uh, many of my friends in the uh, metaphysics and spirituality community say we're on a positive timeline, like the powers that be, they'll never be able to take over because the positive love vibrations and all that are really, really high at this point. And um, the um, end of duality consciousness has happened. It's now positive, um, positive love-based energies and uh, the powers that be can come down as hard as they want, but in the end, they'll never be able to succeed. And I'm thinking if Alex Jones truly does want to talk about more positive things as a, uh, as you said, well, that's just a manifestation of us being on the positive timeline. So uh, could you maybe tell us why the uh, change of heart and Alex's um, attitude towards more positive things now? I think it's a part of, I think a lot of it's growing older and having kids um, and seeing your kids grow up and start to see how the world is affecting them changes you um, a lot of ways because then your, your consciousness is kind of separated between – and I'm speaking for myself at this point because I have I have three kids and seeing how they react to maybe a cartoon they watch or or a situation that they're in. Um, you know, just recently, uh, this fact this happened yesterday. My my uh, in laws were in town and they all went to the mall because it was raining outside and uh, went to go to the Lego store. My kids are really into Legos and my two oldest were playing on an escalator. You know, going up and going down. They weren't like surfing on the handrail or anything. They were just riding the escalator. And this giant woman who probably needs some positive vibrations in her life um, came out from the clothing store and was starting to uh, talk to a security guard. And the security guard was then, you know, berating my kids. And my father-in-law went over there and said, listen, what's, what's going on? And I go, these kids are playing on the escalator. Uh, you know, is that, is that really the end of the world? But my, my, uh, my son's right there, and and he's not necessarily talking back to the security guard, but he goes, we weren't even, we were just riding the escalator. We weren't even doing anything wrong. I mean, everybody rides the escalator. Why are we not allowed to ride the escalator five times in a row? Why is that wrong? And uh, and he's ten years old, and I I see him. I, I'm, I explain stuff to him. He asks me different questions about certain things that he sees, and I explain why it's things are done that way. You know, a lot of people do stuff out of fear. They're just afraid to speak up or they're afraid of what, you know, you might think of them. And I said, you can't go around life, you know, thinking like that. And, you know, I think as you get older, you start, you start, um, your mind definitely changes because you've seen different things. I mean, I used to be pretty liberal minded. I'm still pretty liberal minded on a lot of things, but my, especially uh, financially and, and, and in my own finances, I've become quite conservative and curmudgeon and uh, and then where where I want to spend my money and where, how I want to spend my time has definitely changed as I've gotten older. So I think a lot of that's with age. And, you know, a lot of people think Alex Jones is really old. He's, he's 41. He's not that old. And um, so I, I just think it's – and he sees the responsibility of, you know, what he's got going on here. But I think, you know, one of his – I'll just go ahead and plug uh, InfoWars Life. I think a lot of those products are a huge solution to what's out there. I, I take the iodine, and uh, I've done the oxy powder regimen on several occasions. And, you know, just cleaning out your system and rebooting your uh, your lower intestine and your upper intestine and then putting good, you know, uh, bacteria back in 
is, you know, one of the best things you could do for your body. And I think just all the health information we put out, just going after flu- water fluoridation, I guarantee you the work we've done in water fluoridation has helped change a lot of, of these water districts out here and, and change the federal government's guidelines on it. It's because of the information we're putting out, people are getting it, and then they're running with it. Because we can't, you know, a lot of people think it's Alex's job to change everything, and it's not his job to change everything. Um, you know, his job is, is like, I, like I said before, is being a crier, and it's other people's jobs to pick up the mantle and do their thing. And if, you know, that that may mean not being on the Alex Jones show. It may mean going about it a different way. That's really not for uh, for me to judge. That's kind of how the puzzle pieces lay themselves out. Uh, we've had we had a guy uh, that wanted to put up billboards for us. And he sent me an email this morning saying he started a Kickstarter campaign. Well, I sent that to the writers. I haven't even checked with them to see if they put it up there yet. But, you know, it's just these – there's so much going on right now. It's hard to, like, go to every individual person and make sure that they're being coddled in the right way. You know, I think putting out information that's – if you compare what the information we put out to other people. And, you know, the Alex Jones show, I think, is Alex's outlet to – scream and yell at the world. But if you look at Im- the information that's put on an Infowars.com, it's it's rock solid. And the, the writers that are behind that, uh, Paul Joseph Watson, Kurt Nemo, Adon Salazar, Kit Daniels, Mikhail Thalen, uh, Anthony Gucciardi, these guys are, are very calm, very focused individuals that are interested in the same things I think a lot of your audience is interested in, you know, freedom and uh, liberty and just, you know, less government intrusion on our lives. And and then, you know, pulling the mask, the reason I got into this stuff is I was I was a theater major. I was always interested in what's behind the curtain. And I think a lot of people are interested in that now. And now, the, now the, and this is before the Internet was invented. I was interested in what's behind the curtain. Well, now we get to see everything pretty much with the Internet or, you know, as much as uh, as much as we're allowed to. Um, but, you know, as as for solutions, um you know, you take the information and do with what you want. That's, I think that's a big solution there is to take the information you're given and doing something with it, either by sharing it with other people or changing it in your life and living, being an example of living, you know, be the change you want to be. Um, you know, Luke Radowski is a guy who saw Alex do stuff and then he launched one of the biggest grassroots organizations out there. We are change. And, you know, Mark Dice is a fan of Alex. And now he goes out and makes videos that get, you know, millions of hits. And, um, you know, it's those are those are the t- showing people what is really going on, I think, is a big part of the solution. Do you agree? Absolutely. Um, all right. I um, want to switch gears here. Talk about the uh, upcoming election. Hillary and Jeb Bush seem to be the candidates that everybody says are going to be on the um on the ballot, uh, some other third-party candidates like Jesse Ventura said he wants to run as a third-party candidate, and uh, Andrew Bashago, um is also going to be running as a third-party candidate. He was um, guest on my show. He's best known for uh, talking about the government's uh, secret space program to Mars and also how DARPA has uh, mm. time travel technology and such. He's also uh, going to be running as a third-party candidate. But Hillary and Jeb Bush are the um, the two candidates, Hillary, she is an, an Illuminati grand dom. Fritz Springmeier did expose that in his uh, book, Bloodlines of the Illuminati, which I did read. And um, Jeb Bush, uh, when I had uh, Sherry Edwards on my show, Sherry Edwards, she's a voice analyst specialist. She uses uh, bioacoustics to um, analyze people's voices, just like how you would analyze body language. And she says that based on her analyses of all the candidates, Jeb Bush, his voice shows he would be the um, candidate um, that would be the best one to be president. She did explain that why on my uh, show, if anyone wants to check out my interview with her. But in regards to the upcoming election, I mean, people, people, I mean, I, you have to think, how could people be this lost? I mean, when are people going to be sick of Clintons and Bushes being presidents all the time? For all intents and purposes, Barack Obama is a Clinton because you guys have talked about how um, the Clintons have blackmailed him as the evidence shows and such. So, uh, I mean, are, are you as sick and tired as I am that people are not getting sick and tired of too many Clintons and Bushes in the White House? And in regards to um, the upcoming election of Hillary and Jeb, what do you have to say about this? Well, I think, one, it's disgusting. Um, but I think they're all Hydras uh, or heads of the Hydra of, of the Bush clan. I mean, you could go back to uh, once Reagan got shot that uh, Daddy Bush became president at that point. So he had 
two and a half terms. And then you've got um, Clinton, who had two terms, uh, who was really just a Bush. And uh, and then you can, and then you have George W. Bush, and then you have um, Obama, who is a, a Clinton via a Bush. And so I think we've just been being ruled by the Bush uh, machine since the early 80s. So I, do I see anything different? No, they're going to have both candidates in. Vince McMahon's got this game rigged already. There's a, you know, they're going to keep it interesting, I think, because they need people to watch the news so they can get their drug advertisements and know what which new pills they need to ask their doctor for. But I don't think that, you know, as much as I'd, I'd rather see Rand Paul or Ted Cruz, even though I don't think either one of them are perfect by any stretch of the means. And I don't think we're ever going to have a perfect presidential candidate. I don't think that's where we should uh, – focus on our, our, our attention on. But Hillary and Bush, my campaign will be vote for no one, don't vote at all, and and we protest by not showing up. But I know there's so many gullible people out there that are just so for their Republican or Democrat. Uh, you know, when uh, Kerry was running against Bush, this is probably going to freak some people out. Well, probably not. But I actually traveled with a Democratic group. I, I, I wanted to do something. I was actually laid off at the time. I was working, uh, doing freelance video work. And uh, I went and traveled with a group to Florida because that was a swing state. And, but as I was going around, I, I was basically telling people to vote for the Libertarian candidate and vote for neither one. But I went with this whole group of Democrats, and they were so into John Kerry, and it was so disgusting just – listening to them fawn over this guy who basically is a charlatan. Um, you know, he, he came through his, all of his money and finances through his wife. He's, you know, you can look at all the swift boating and all that stuff in Vietnam, but he was actually against going back and actually looking for POWs, him and John McCain, who claimed to be for the veterans and all that. They, they were absolutely against going back and, and looking for any of the POWs because a lot of these guys were actually being, shipped to Russia for intel uh, during that time. Um, but that's that's neither here nor there. The, yeah, uh, uh, a Hillary-Bush ticket or election, sham election, I, I, don't, I think people should just protest en masse and not vote at all. But we're never going to have a real election until we get rid of the voting machine. So it doesn't matter um, how many candidates they put out there. We're never going to see what a real election will be like because they're, they're – it, it's it's a fake process. You know, you're going and talking to a computer that can easily be hacked. It can be hacked by anyone at any time. So you're never going to get a true result. That's why every bond issue that means spending more money in more Agenda 21 is always passed on the local level because you have electronic voting fraud. So you're never going to see what what our country wants to do in any capacity as long as we have that process in place. And that's got to be the first thing that changes. And that's got to be something that's done locally. That's a real solution. Get rid of your damn voting machines because they're not doing anything. There's no reason that we need our election results any quicker than somebody counting paper ballots one at a time and somebody else looking over their left shoulder and somebody else looking over their right shoulder, preferably of two different parties. Um, so you at least have some accountability there. You know, then you have to have three people lying to uh, get a mixed result. But, we, you know, we've seen that even with paper ballots. People putting the League of Women Voters, I think, is, is, a, is a scam. You know, we, there's video of them taking those out of yes piles and putting them in the no pile or taking them out of the no pile and putting them into the yes pile. It's, it's disgusting. It's disgusting that, hey, we talk about all this fairness and everything and how we always have to play on a fair field and everybody gets to be a winner, except when it comes for the stuff that really counts, which is how our lives are going to be run. That always has to be controlled by some minute, uh, some minority that seems to be very rich and very powerful all the time. Never the person with the ideas that make sense. It's always the one who doesn't really say anything, who, who, who offers nothing of any substance, but is backed by giant money interests. Thank you for giving your take on that, Rob. Um, I'd like to turn back the clock and go to some things in the past. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> 9-11. I remember you um, once talking about on an InfoWars Info Nightly News episode where what you were doing when 9-11 happened. And uh, I remember you saying on that, and Alex Jones was saying 9-11 was an inside job from day one. Well, a couple of issues um, I have with the 9-11 uh, truth movement. I mean, I love my fellow 9-11 truthers with all my heart. I go up to... Um, 
uh, New York every uh, 9-11 anniversary. I've been trying to since uh, 2011. And uh, But the issue I have is there's a couple of things about um, the truth movement that uh, really grind my gears, so to speak, as Peter Griffin, the family guy, would say. And that is the truth movement seems to sometimes act like more of an acceptance into society movement than a truth movement. Um, case in point, there was a episode of the Alex Jones show like two and a half years ago where a caller called in and said, Alex, I think John Lear is right when he says that the planes that hit the Twin Towers were holograms. And the evidence shows it because you see the planes disappear into the Twin Towers and it doesn't slow down as it's going into the towers. Don't you think we should start talking about that, Alex? And Alex Jones refused to talk about it because he feared that it would discredit the 9-11 truth movement. Well, there's nothing discrediting about it because it fits the scientific method. If you listen to my interview with John Lear and also Jim Fetzer, I interviewed them both. We talk about how the fact that the planes were holograms is one of the easiest things to prove through the scientific method. I mean, the government has a couple different technologies, secret technologies to pull that off, and trying to prove exactly which technology they used is is not so easy, but simply proving it is a piece of cake. I mean, the same thing with the whole direct energy weapon theory. The government has several different types of direct energy weapons that they could use to dustify the Twin Towers, and it's not so easy to figure out which one they used, but simply proving that it was a direct energy weapon is a piece of cake by, by virtue of the fact that the World Trade Center dust was microscopic and the fact that there was nothing in the pile, unlike other controlled demolitions where there is a lot like a big pile, these controlled demolition piles, they were there was like nothing there. It was flat out dustified. Now, this whole issue of the actually one more thing I have to say about this. When I was at the nine eleven um anniversary in New York last nine eleven, I did watch a presentation by Richard Gage and um like he was preaching to the choir. In fact, some some people said, "Do you ever think you're preaching to the choir, Richard?" And he said, "Well, yeah, but when it comes to big issues like 9/11, there's you got to preach to the choir till the cows come home." And it's understandable. But one person actually brought up a couple of articles on the website Veterans Today, and uh, Richard Gates said, "Veterans Today is a horrible site because it talks about how the uh, planes were holographic planes and direct energy weapons took down the twin towers." I could not believe what I was hearing. I wanted to get up out of my seat and scream, Richard, you got this all wrong. I mean, seeing the irony about this, this Richard Gage is like the 9-11 truther who you would most associate with using the scientific method to prove a point, and yet he says that a, a, a website is a horrible site because it uses a scientific method to prove something about 9-11, like the planes being holograms and such. I mean, give me a break. I did actually come up to him after the, his talk and address it with him and tell him, you got this all wrong, Richard, and, and he was like, well, the issue I have with people like Judy Wood is they say say things like nanothermite was not used. Well, the whole nanothermite issue, um, nanothermite probably was used. I mean, there is evidence that it was used to sever the building columns and also to create the uh, wild E. coyote cutout, as John Lear calls it, of the airplane in the in the South Tower, because there is, there is what, what appears to be like sparks coming out, like there's a thermite reaction. But there have been articles written showing that nanothermite by itself could not have dustified the Twin Towers in the way that they were dustified. You would have to use a direct energy weapon for that. And in my interview with Alfred Weber of Exopolitics TV, he asserted that HARP, um, as in government weather modification technology, HARP was also used. He said that um, nuclear bombs, mini nukes, or even a direct energy death ray on a space-based platform in Earth's orbit, like John Lear said, could not have dustified the towers in the manner that they were. You would have had to use... um, some sort of a weather modification technology, but a lot of 9-11 truthers will not talk about this, and it seems like the reason they don't want to talk about it is because they think that it would, well, like, discredit them, because the idea of holographic planes and direct energy death rays and such is something that the average person in society is going to find too crazy to believe, so they're going to, it's going to turn them off. Well, that's a problem. Because, like, the fear of what other people think is the worst prison you could possibly be in, and 9-11 truthers and other truth movement people, for that matter, are putting themselves in that prison whenever they don't want to talk about really far-out things because they fear that it would discredit the truth movement, which, like I said, is basically what Alex Jones was doing when that caller said he thinks John Lear was right about the planes being holograms. Um, Alex has even often said, I don't want to talk about something unless I can prove it. Well, I just said, you can prove the planes were holograms, so why not talk about it? Well, I just explained why, because he thinks we'll discredit the truth movement. Well, do you think maybe um, Alex should change his attitude about this and all the other 9-11 truth- truthers? Are you going to say, hey, let them talk about what they want to talk about. Let's not change their minds. Let the truthers discuss what they want to discuss and let us other truthers stay out of it. <laughs> 
Well, that's a big old can of worms. I think <clears throat> what I think is that what they said, what the official story is, is totally wrong. Now, the hologram thing, I've heard that. I've heard that, you know, they were drone planes. I've heard lots of different things. <clears throat> have we seen, you know, have we seen the machine that makes the holograms? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different – people are looking for concrete evidence. So when you start making these uh, claims, and, yeah, maybe, you know, who you said, Jim Fetzer and who – Norman Lear? Is this the guy who made the Lear jet, or is this a different guy? John Lear. John Lear. John Lear. John Lear. Okay. I mean, is he involved with the Lear jet, or is he? Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's I mean, the Lear jet. He holds many world records. He's guy. also known for blowing the whistle on UFO and extraterrestrial stuff. But he has talked about nine yeah. eleven as well. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I think in order to, if we are going to ever get a new investigation into nine eleven, which I think at this point we're not, you know, I think the 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 way people were going about it and not agreeing with whatever because there's how many different theories did you just name in your question your lead-up question i mean at least 10 to 15 different theories of how the towers came down and the question then the answer to that is i mean you may think you have the answer but in reality i don't think anybody knows how any of that stuff came down except the people who pulled it off and that we have to find those people and then probably uh waterboard them to get the confession but we that is what I think the issue with the 9-11 truth movement is. Now, everybody pretty much agrees with the Oklahoma City bombing that it wasn't a truck bomb, took it out. You know, and there's, we, you know, and we, and we know this without even seeing the video. We could just look at the aftermath and the way the columns were blown up. I mean, I think that is a lot more provable than you, you're saying in 2001 they had holographic technology Yet, have we seen any of that since then? I mean, I'll I'll take a gander at the – I'll be a devil's advocate against the holographic technology, and maybe you can answer some of these questions. Have we seen that technology being used since then? Or, or is this something they're going to roll out once in 2001 and then never use it again? Whereas most of the time when the government uses something like drones, they use them over and over and over again because it's something they know how to do, and they do it. And so I guess that would be my first – question to you, to you what where have these holograms been used since then well the, jim fetzer he believes that the um the planes were um projections from some aircraft i believe it's like a triangle shaped aircraft which has the ability to um project an image of something he believes that that technology was used because he found a um government website that showed it and then after he tried to show that website and make it go public the government took it down and to him that was the um evidence that that kind of projection technology like a ufo that can project an image of a of a plane was used. However, other people like Alfred Weber of Exopolitics TV say that it was actually a UFO with the ability to put a mask of a plane around it, a holographic mask. It could project around it. And he said that the bulge that you can see on the bottom of the plane that hit the South Tower um, is evidence that it was a um, UFO with a holographic mask of a plane around it. Now, a lot of 9-11 truthers would say, well, if we start debating exactly which type of technology they use well that's going to discredit the truth movement because they're going to say hey you can't agree on what technology they use that discredits you and they'll do whatever they can to to discredit us but as far as i'm concerned the fact that the government has more than one type of technology to um pull off something like that only adds credibility to the theory so um this technology i mean it's kept in secret in um well it's not secret in the sense that whistleblowers have blown the whistle on it but you get my drift i mean like jim fetzer said there was a website that showed it and like ufo whistleblowers like john lear he did talk we did talk about this in my interview with him he's uh he's talked about it and as far as like um Direct energy weapons, you got the the mini nuclear bombs, which we know they have, and John Lear did say, I know for a fact that up above the Earth's atmosphere, we do have direct energy death rays, like in the, remember the direct energy, epi, direct energy weapon episode of a Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura, uh, John Hutchinson, he said that such a technology does exist up in the Earth's atmosphere, and it's been around since uh, at least the uh, Star Wars program during the Reagan administration, so um, does that help um, answer your question, Rob? Um, I mean, it it kind of does, but I think w your argument of why people aren't actually going out and and going with that theory is because 
it's um, and I'm not going to say it discredits it because you know it, I don't think I think the mainstream media opinion of the of people who believe that 9/11 was an inside job or is automatically that discredits you in their eyes. So you know people. I guess like Richard Gage um, are probably going, look, I'm an engineer. I'm going to, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of how the buildings came down and this was wrong. And so he doesn't want to go into that area because he's staking his professional reputation along that with all of his other engineers and architects. I'm saying, you know, we know the buildings didn't come down because of jet fuel. And that's what he's staking his reputation on. And then I think for him to go out and say, well, maybe it was, you know, UFO space platforms shooting a beam down. I think that gets a little too science fiction for him. And uh, and at that point, you know, he, he doesn't want to go there. And I think there's a lot of people that don't want to go there. I mean, I'm not – I personally, I, I wouldn't go there either. If you're, you're trying to prove something, you don't try to prove what happened. You just try to prove what they're saying is wrong. And then you start trying to find the truth after that once you can get – Everybody on board saying, okay, we agree that the official story is wrong. We've, and here's the evidence of that. Now, let's look at what's going right, but let's convince more people that what they're saying is wrong. I mean, there's still people that think Kennedy was shot by one guy. So, you know, I guess that, I, you know, I, I guess I don't agree with the, uh, the hologram theory. I would need to see more evidence and I would, you know, send me, send me some links to some stuff. I'll check it out. But at, uh, you know, and I've, I've seen, yeah, some people say it was mini nuclear bombs. Some people say it was rays that took the towers down. Uh, you know, we're never going to find out probably. But we do know that the official story is wrong, and I think that's something that we can all stand on and come together at that point. And all this other stuff, I mean, I think it's just it's just a, a way for other people to say, look, you guys came, you can't agree on anything. How do we know you're right? Well, let's all agree that the official story is total BS and work from there. And and get some people on the record that day. Um, You know, like Barry Jennings was a guy that was saying people were already dead before the tower, this building seven came down. And then he mysteriously died and he's barely ever mentioned in the uh, nine 11 lore. And that, that should be the biggest, I think one of the biggest smoking guns of nine 11. So. Thanks a lot, Rob. Hey, if you want to uh, see the evidence for the holographic planes and direct energy weapons, again, I interviewed uh, Jim Fetzer and John Lear. Those interviews are on YouTube. All my interviews on YouTube, just uh, type Nature of Reality Radio, John Lear, or uh, Jim Fetzer. You'll find those interviews if you want to check it out. But okay. um, a couple of other things I want to turn back the clock on. Let's go back to uh, American Revolution times. A couple of things I want to talk about in regards to the um, American Revolution and the Constitution. Um Everybody's um, obsessed about the Constitution in America. All the diehard patriots say the Constitution was the greatest document ever made and such and all that. Well, there is something about the Constitution that um, I do want to address. And um, some say it's a rather arcane way of looking at the Constitution. Others say, well, maybe we should give this a little more credence. But the point is, anyone who's ever read Lysander Spooner's book, No Treason, would know that even though the founding fathers, they may have had good, they know they almost certainly had good intentions for the American people when they gathered together in Philadelphia in 1787 to for that convention to get rid of the Articles of Confederation and create a constitution. However, as Lysander Spooner exposes in great detail in his book, No Treason, the founding fathers did pass the constitution without the consent of the common people. And that means that the Constitution is and always has been an illegal, invalid document. It doesn't actually exist. And the tyrants in the U.S. government are very well aware of this. And the real reason they take an oath to defend the Constitution and the real reason they always make reference to the Constitution saying things like, we're going to try to see if this will keep in line with the principles of the Constitution. It's all a a parlor trick, all a scam to um, play us for a sap and sucker us to – maintain the illusion that the Constitution exists, because as long as they can maintain the illusion that the U.S. federal Constitution is a living, breathing document, which it isn't, as Lysander Spooner proves, then it's rather easy for them to violate it without consequence, knowing that it's not legally binding upon the American people. Um, Now, anybody who – I don't know of any time where it's ever been mentioned on the Alex Jones show or almost any other Patriot shows that the uh, Constitution is an illegal document. Well, actually, Eddie Craig of Rule of Law Radio, I know he's often, uh, he was a guest on my show. He's uh, talked about how the Constitution is technically an illegal document. But do you 
feel that maybe it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to expose that the Constitution does not actually exist in order to prove that our government is uh, playing us for a sap? Well, I think I've seen the Constitution in D.C., if that's what <laughs> the document that you're referring to, and I've read different versions, so um, I don't know. Maybe I'm misinformed, but uh, <laughs> that's a it's, Interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've i never delved into that area that the Constitution doesn't exist. I've always, you know, I've read the Constitution several times. I've read the Bill of Rights. Does that include the Bill of Rights, too? Uh, yeah, well, they, they well it exist? doesn't affect our rights in any way because the only entity that can grant rights is the Creator, also known as God, right. also known as – yeah, so that doesn't affect sure, our rights in any yeah. way. So, um, but – some say, well, let's still expose the Constitution is an illegal document that doesn't actually exist to show the government is uh, playing us for a sap and show that everything basically that's been happening since uh, since 1787 when it was created has been done as a result of one great big parlor trick. Uh, so you, you don't think that's a, that's a good way of looking at the Constitution? Some say that is a um, rather arcane way of uh, looking at it. Well, I mean, the Constitution was written on how this is how you set up your government. This is how we're going to vote. This is how we're going to do things. And, you know, whether whether if people are saying it wasn't written in or if it was written to be a fake document to fool us. Uh, yeah, I'd have to I'd have to see more uh, evidence into that. I'm not I'm not ready to jump into that pool. And others are and they can hate me if they want. I, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I mean, I mean, you should still, I, um, as far as I'm concerned, make reference to the Constitution whenever you're like, like if you're a defendant at a trial and your rights are violated, then it certainly wouldn't hurt to uh, make reference to the Constitution, even though it's not binding upon you. You still want to, um, still want to make reference to it because the well, courts and the government are trying to maintain the illusion that it exists, so it wouldn't hurt to to use it. Sure, and it's it's like that drill they were running in Richmond, California, where the guy says, "I'm a sovereign citizen. I don't believe in you." You know, if that was a real life person and that was real life National Guard troops and they real life attacked you, it doesn't really matter if you don't uh, sway to their authority or not. They're still putting the boot on your head. And so whether you say that you don't believe in them or not, I, I think at that point it's mute. So, you know, I mean, you could you could say it's all just a dream. You could be the, I had a, I remember this kid in school, you would call him the dream boy because he used to say it's all just a dream. Everything's a dream. We're just a dream and when did this kind of Bill Hicks routine? This is even before I'd heard of Bill Hicks. But, um, you know, yeah, you could take, I guess, that attitude about everything. Well, you know, this computer that I'm talking through right now doesn't exist. It's all just a dream, and we're just part of a simulation. But, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I'm having trouble kind of answering the question of whether the Constitution is a real document because I, I probably haven't read enough history on that. To uh, to give a correct opinion, but I think right. it exists at this point. All right. Well, the principles of the Constitution are definitely worth following because the founding fathers, sure. like I said, they had uh, good intentions for the uh, American people when they created that. Um, but speaking of which, um, want to talk about the American Revolution for a little bit because um, the American Revolution has been made out to be um, one of the greatest underdog victories in the history of humanity. But but in reality, it wasn't like that. Every single war since the time of ancient Sumeria, when the Illuminati bloodlines have, have, have controlled humanity, has been an illusion because the powers that be were controlling both sides to manipulate the war the way they wanted it. And the whole purpose behind the American Revolution was, to, was for the Illuminati bloodlines to convert America into a country that felt like a prison with bars into a country that felt like a prison without bars. The same is true with the French Revolution to turn France into a prison with bars into a prison without bars to make the re the citizens of that country feel that they are free when, in fact, they aren't. It was just one great big experiment. And then over the course of time, the Illuminati bloodlines wanted to um, slowly take away the rights of everybody, scare and brainwash the common people into giving up liberty for security. The Founding Fathers, they were innocent pawns in this whole thing. I mean, the Founding Fathers, the vast majority of them were Freemasons, and you can tell that there was a, a conspiracy to cover, up, cover that up because 
Um, we learned about the American Revolution, to my knowledge, in fifth grade, eighth grade, some in college courses I took, and even in elementary school. And I cannot remember one single instance in all the textbooks, the research papers, and everything that I looked at where the word Freemason was mentioned. And when you realize that the vast majority of the founding fathers were Freemasons, you realize that's a huge oversight. They're obviously trying to to cover something up. Well, yeah, like I tried – I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, the thing that they're covering up is the fact that the American Revolution was one great big illusion, and the idea that 13 ragtag colonies could actually stand a chance against a, a British Empire, which the sun never set on, as they said, it, it's downright asinine. The only reason we won the war is because the powers that be let it happen, and in my interview with Fritz Springmeier, we did talk about some of this, and one interesting thing he pointed out was the whole thing about Betsy Ross and the um, the flag with the 13 stars. That's total American Revolution mythology. That flag with the um, 13 stars um, that looks like our current flag, which has 50 stars, but it had 13 stars in the past. That 13 star flag was actually an a, a draft of a flag that was thought was never actually officially made, but it was going to be at one point put up for consideration to be the flag of the British East India Company, which you can think of as a um, back-in-the-day version of what is um, the powers that you want to make, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It was a big global operation, the British East India Company was, and the 13-stripe flag was actually, excuse me, the 13-star flag was one of their original draft flags for that, and talk about ironic. It just goes to show you that, um, well, the American Revolution, like I said, is one great big illusion. So um, I realize it may be kind of sensitive to talk about this, and even Fritz Springmeier said, oh, this is a subject that could get me in a lot of trouble talking about because Americans are so proud of their history that they wouldn't want to hear something like this. But do you feel maybe it may not be such a bad idea to expose the fact that the American Revolution was a great big illusion and the founding fathers were innocent pawns in this conspiracy and had no idea that all the good things they stood for were to be taken away over the course of time. Um, hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I do, I do agree with you that most of the founding fathers were Masons. Um, I do agree with you there. And, you know, these guys were, these guys were basically, um, if I could find a modern day example, who's the guy Vit Jetlinka, the guy who wants to have his own Lieberland in the middle of uh, between Czechoslovakia and Slovenia? Um, you know, guys looking to not pay taxes and have their own form of government and not be dictated by you know the crown. Um, now, I do I do think the uh, I do think England still holds influence over the United States. Now, whether that's they came back through with the Federal Reserve and and took back control that way, um, or if it was just all along and that was their show and they just kind of faded off in the distance. But then you know we're we're just going to fund certain candidates to get them in and, and do this do this thing. But you know they eventually got their bank, so I think in the end their goal was met of you know control over the United States through means of predatory banking practices. Um, but yeah, do we know our real history? No, we, and we're not taught the real history. We're taught a sanitized version that that both sides of of the system agree on that this is okay to teach people. Um, I don't think they would ever teach the real version of the American history. I don't think we're taught. Um, you know, we're taught a lot about how the Indians. You know, we massacred the Indians. Well, when we first got here, the Indians were massacring us, and I think it's. You know, fair to look at. Let's look at both sides. Let's look at what really happened, not just one side of it. Saying, you know, in the end, we did beat the Indians because we were able to use our uh, our numbers and and uh, disease warfare and and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that's good and that's right. And I think we probably could have created a society where both groups could have existed, but at the time, that was seen as a threat to the. It's always something different is a threat, and that's how humans live their lives. If something's different than me, it's got to be wrong. It's got to be bad. So we have to either wipe it off the face of the earth or make it ineffectual, which is kind of what they did to the American Indians. Not kind of. It's what they did. So, yeah, I, I think we could definitely use a, a restructuring of our whole historical foundation 
and look at his, you know, people always do, they do these things. So this is what history is really about. And it's never what it's really about. It's always some version of what somebody wants to portray. But will we ever know? I mean, history is always written by the victors. Uh, and, you know, I think at the end, that's people like Carnegie and Rockefeller who started giant publishing companies and uh, J.P. Morgan that started these, you know, educational foundations, those are the real winners because they were able, they're able to rewrite history. And if you look at the textbooks that we looked at in high school and compared to them to now, they're completely different. And so I think those guys are the ones rewriting history. And yeah, it is a, I would totally agree that we live in a prison without bars, uh, that we think we're free. And that is, is there's nothing further from the truth, but people have to invest in something you have to have a team to root for. So, you know, why not root for people? I think people think that why not, you know, just root for USA because we're at least better than most of these countries. Thank you, Rob. Um, let's go to present day issues now. The NSA uh, surveillance system. Now, um, in my interview with Sherry Edwards, um, we actually did an analysis of Edward Snowden and um, she did a voice analysis of him. She said that her voice analysis shows that Edward Snowden is definitely not a double agent, No, uh, with all due respect to Dr. Steve Pachenik and Webster Tarpley and others who have hypothesized that he is, but he's not. She said if he was, then you would see some sort of an octave tone of sorts in his voice, and that, that isn't showing, and there's a few other things that hint that he isn't. But the issue is not what Edward Snowden is. The issue is what the NSA is doing. And Edward Snowden has said um, he is planning to throw out a holy shit revelation of sorts, as he says, but he hasn't really done that yet. And Sherry Edwards told me that based on her voice analysis of him, Snowden is actually all the NSA and GCHQ documents that he has. He's, for all intents and purposes, wearing them as a cloak or a shield around him to protect himself in the event that anybody comes after him. He can say, stay away from me or I'm going to release information that exposes you as a criminal. And that's one reason why he isn't releasing everything all at once like he could. Now, if I met Edward Snowden face to face, I would love to get right in his face and say, Snowden, I love you, man. But give us what the, the hell's your Spence. Yeah, what's your you problem? Know, Why don't you just release everything all at once? And, well, I'd like to see what his answer would be. Something tells me he might say something like, well, I'm not ready to because I don't think humanity can handle the truth or, or something to that effect. But – um do you think maybe that is the reason why Edward Snowden isn't releasing everything all at once because he thinks humanity can't handle the truth, or maybe there is some other reason behind it? Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it seems like the guy who's doing it, Glenn Greenwald, I think, has the most vested interest in keeping in, in the doling out process because he's able to. Um, He's able to use that as a carrot, saying, "Look, we've got more coming. Just stay tuned." And if I were, and their their argument is, if we release it all at once, you'll you'll miss some of the stuff. So we're releasing a little bit at the time to build this giant case that our government is evil. Well, people who already think the government is evil don't care about that. They just want to see the damn documents. And I'm I'm in that group. That's just give give it to me. All different people will set up or groups and people can take different pages and start reading it and going over it. And, you know, we'll have, we'll still have plenty of news to write and there will be plenty of news for the news cycles, but let's get it all out there and then, you know, use that to start prosecuting people. I think we need, you know, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. Unfortunately, that we're, we're going to prosecute anybody in, in any of these things. Just like, I don't think anybody's ever going to be brought to justice on nine 11, which is a shame, but I think these, these revolving centers around us are so big that they're going to stop this. But um, yeah, I, I would love to see everything Edward Snowden has in his pocket, but I, you know, but once he releases it, what are they going to do? Well, it, what, they're going to kill him? You know, it's, he's already released it. I think he's in more danger by not releasing it. Uh, it's like the, uh, the DC madam, when she was on Alex's show before she died, she wasn't releasing information. And this lady basically just wanted to go retire out in the French villa that she had bought. And that made the government scared. They're like, well, what's she going to say? So they killed her. I firmly believe that people in the government silenced that woman. Um, so I think he's in more danger by not releasing stuff than he is by releasing stuff. And I hope he has a contingency plan if they do shut him up 
they assassinate him in front of the Kremlin, that he uh, has got some way to get this information out. Thanks, and it's nice to see that uh, William Binney has um, decided to come out on the Alex Jones show to um, talk about uh, – talk about the NSA thing. Now, it seems like a lot of whistleblowers, um, the uh, um, pet peeve that I have with some whistleblowers is that they do have a tendency to act like gatekeepers. Like um, one classic example is how uh, like Edward Snowden, um, Bill Binney, Tom, well, Bill Binney's actually somewhat retracted this because he did say there needs to be investigation in 9-11, but Thomas Drake and Edward Snowden, they have acted like the official story of 9-11 is true when I know that they know that there is no way that the official story is true, but for some inexplicable reason, they insist on playing dumb. Like when Edward Snowden was interviewed by um, – by Brian Jennings. Uh, Brian Jennings said, we have to understand those terrorists on 9-11. They did it in amazing fashion. Don't you think the NSA surveillance system is justified? And I don't remember what Stone said, but he was playing dumb and acting like the um, like the official story is true. He didn't, uh, yeah, he didn't come out and say, you're an idiot for believing in the official story of 9-11, which is what he Do you have any hunches as to why whistleblowers play gatekeeper like that and play dumb and act like the official story of 9-11 and some other things are, are true? I... I think they are in the realm of we have to maintain this look of credibility. I guess it's, it might be in the same position what you were saying earlier with all the theories of 9-11. And some people don't want to go into that realm because they want their work to be to be in the eyes of academia to maintain its prowess. You know, I think that's what they're, that's what they're doing. I, I'm sure, well, you know, I don't know. I think there's a lot of people that really do believe that that these guys with box cutters were able to fly airplanes into the the World Trade Center and make amazing maneuvers and hit the Pentagon, which I think is totally, uh, you know, totally ridiculous. And nothing could be, I think nothing could be further than the truth than the official story of 9-11. So to even entertain that fact, I think is, is, you know, kind of disingenuous, but, you know, you got to understand these people that work, that went and worked for the government at one time, they really believed in what they were doing. They were vested in the government, and a lot of people that work for the government are vested in the government. My, I have an uncle who used to work for the FBI, and he still, you know, when I every time I see him, I bring up these FBI informants that you know keep coming in. He was across the street when the first World Trade Center was bombed. His offices were well, he said it across the street. It could have been down the block. I don't know, but he said he was right there after you know after it happened. They heard it. They heard the explosion, and. Um, you know, he, he defends the use of FBI informants setting people up. He says this is how we get the bad guys. So I think in, in the end of the day, these people have been brainwashed from a young age that the government is good. And if it's just a few people in the government, instead of looking at the giant and totality of the government saying it's too damn big, it needs to be scaled back by a magnitudes of, I think, 100 to get to, to just doing what they're supposed to be doing – which is not creating, you know, they say, oh, there's gridlock in Congress. They didn't get anything done. That's a successful Congress, in my opinion. You know, let's not get anything done. Let's have gridlock. Let's have it be real hard to make a lobby pass because every law is another thing that they could either fine you for or put you in jail for. So, But I think in the end, you know, William Benny was a government man. You know, as, as much as I agree with the stuff he said, and I think it's great that he came out and said it, but I think it, it – at the base level, these guys all believe at one time wholeheartedly what they were doing, and they don't see the things that they uncovered as relating to the whole government. Just it's just well, it's just part of the NSA. You know, this is just some bad things that we decided to do with the NSA, and you know they were violating people's rights, but they don't see the entire government as a whole being in on it because you know what, and maybe they're right because in, in some ways, because they're in on it and they know not in on it in a bad way, but they're inside the government and they're working with all these people day to day. And these people all seem like them. Does that make any sense? You know, you're working with this guy. This guy's not out to stab me in the back. Well, yeah, he's a low level government minion. You know, it's the people, it's a, the, the, the federal reserve people who are, you know, on top of that. It's the people funding the way government policies are, are, made that's where you got to look at who's fund who's who's crew who's funding the way these policies are being written that circumvent our rights right um and do you um think it's possible that maybe in the near future like some of the other nsa whistleblowers like um 
like Tom Drake um, and Russell Tice and uh, maybe even Edward Stoughton someday will want to follow Bill Binney's lead and actually show up on the Alex Jones show because it seems like those uh, Bill Binney's the only one who wants to um, is willing to come on in a quote unquote conspiracy news source like Alex Jones, all the other um, um, people like Drake and um, Snowden, they only want to be interviewed by um, by like mainstream news sources like RT and um, and such. So, and I think that that's a that's not a good idea. You got to be willing to to get on some conspiracy news sources to get the information out and not be selective. Um, do you see it happening in your future that they'll follow Bill Binney's lead or not? Well, you know, and I prefer to call it alternative media because I think we're an alternative to right. Sorry about that. Pushed by the mainstream, but that's that's okay. Um, but yeah, I wish they would come on. We've we've put the invitation out to Snowden. We've put it out to Glenn Greenwald too to come on and talk about this stuff. And, and you know, they for some reason or another, you know, don't want to come on. We've even put it out to Seymour Hirsch when he first put out the Bin Laden thing. We're like, hey, come and talk about it. He goes, well, I'm writing a book. I don't want to talk about it. So he wanted to get his book written, and now he's written the book. And now, you know, but I think in the end, it looks like Seymour Hersh probably believes they killed bin Laden. I think bin Laden was dead, and they probably killed some guy that they said was bin Laden, it, even if somebody even really got shot up, which is, it, it seems like somebody got shot at this point. But, you know, I, I think it was a body double or just an old man that they called bin Laden. I don't think it was bin Laden. I think he's been dead for a long time. Yeah, uh, there's been a little controversy about um how he died. I mean, uh, Dr. Steve Pachenik, he said that bin Laden died of Marfan syndrome in December 2001, but um, former Pakistani president Benazir Bhutto, she um, was killed after she said bin Laden was dead, but her story about bin Laden's death, I believe, was a little different than what uh, Dr. Steve uh, Pachenik said. I mean, are they on different timelines or something? Or, I mean, is they, are, were they given information by sources that were uh, lying? Do you have any theories as to maybe why they gave different stories as to how bin Laden died? Well, I, th- I think they're getting intelligence from different sources. And do I think either one of them saw the body? No. They're, they're, being, they're getting what they were told by some a source of, of some sort or some sort of intelligence report. I don't, I don't think either one of them saw the body. So, you know, Steve's probably relaying, Dr. Pachinik's relaying what he saw or what he heard, and Ben Izzerbuto's doing the same thing. She's, you know, somebody got, she got a report, and Bin Laden's been dead. And I think it, I think, uh, it was Madeline Albright said he were keeping him on ice at some point to, to roll him out. And, you know, yeah, he was this convenient boogeyman that his family was so important, we had to fly them out right after 9-11. And uh, no, no one wants to talk about that. You know, that's, we'll, we'll talk about this Bin Laden thing, whether it's true or not. But hey, why did we fly out his entire family out of the United States when there was a no-fly zone around the entire country at the time? That never gets. That's just kind of one of those. Oh, it just happened. You know, it's one of those aside things, or, or why Colin Powell was having breakfast with uh, the head of the Pakistani ISI, who gave a hundred thousand dollars to Muhammad Atta. You know, those questions are irrational. Or why we didn't go to Saudi Arabia and invade them when most of the hijackers are from Saudi Arabia? You know, we we then go defend them in Iraqi wars. And, you know, those those questions, I think the real questions are never asked. It's always these kind of sidebar, sidebar things. And, um, you know, but yeah, I don't, I think he was dead. I don't know how he died, but I think he was dead. Uh, Yeah, by the way, you meant. You mentioned uh, Saudi Arabia 9-11. It's been coming out recently that Saudi Arabia did play a huge role. I mean, we know that it wasn't just the U.S. government. It was also the Israeli Mossad. To a, to a great extent, the documentary 9-11 Missing Links is one of the best sources out there that talks about the, the Mossad involvement and all that, and also how all the people on the, the most of the people on the project for a new American century were Rothschild mm-hmm. Zionists. People can call me anti-Semitic if they want. I don't give a rat Zionist if they do, but um, every Rothschild Zionist, regardless of whatever government a corporation they works for works for the Mossad and considers the Mossad to be their headquarters. So one could make the argument in a sense the Mossad was the mastermind behind 9-11, but the Saudi, the Saudi Arabian government was um, leading it to a great extent. Um, the book, The Big Bamboozle, um, the author who wrote that book was murdered and his family was murdered. It talked about how uh, Saudi Arabia played a great role in um, staging 9-11. Can you maybe give the listeners some sources that would uh, talk about how the Saudis um, played a huge role in 9-11 for all those people that want to research the matter a little bit further? Yeah, I've, I've read so much about 9-11. I, I, you know, George Humphrey wrote a book. Um, I think he called it The Great Illusion. 
that was a good one. Uh, Webster Tarpley wrote a book about it. Uh, Alex had some chapters about it. I think Webster's was uh, Synthetic Terror. I think that was his book on 9-11. Um, God, uh, oh. I think most of what I've read about 9-11, uh, the 9-11 blog is a good source. Uh, the I think it's a 9-11 blog or 9-11 blogger. I think is is a, I haven't been to that site in a while because I haven't been really researching 9/11 that much. Um, in fact, let's see. Yeah, 9/11 blogger. I did grab one of his articles the other day on on 9/11. The U.S. military was preparing for a simulated nuclear war. It was one of was also one of the exercises. And in addition to a vigilant guardian, there was global guardian that was being run at the same time to practice Armageddon. So. You know, what I look at are sources that, you know, how many sources are at the end of your article? That's usually what I go to If, when researching this. I would say for young people, when people are writing articles about stuff, go look at their sources and then go click on those sources. Just because they put a source there doesn't necessarily mean they're actually getting the information from that source. So you should actually verify through the sources that are being put and then verify those sources if that's possible. Um, to look at these things. I think this 9-11 blogger article had something like 58 different sources in it. And, you know, books, interviews, different different things going on uh, during 9-11. So, you know, that, I can't point to any one piece of evidence, um, you know, other than you know, there's a vast accumulated amount of knowledge since what, what we're going on. 15 years. It'll be 15 years this year or 14 years this year. Something like that. It's been a long time. It was three jobs ago for me. <laughs> right. And the world um, has changed a lot since then. That's that's for damn sure. Well, people are waking up, and that's a good thing. Uh, just so you know, the live feed for this show is going to be going off in 8 minutes and 25 seconds. Uh, we can still go a little after that if you need to finish up a thought or, or, or something, but... um. One other thing I want to talk about here is the whole subject of uh, kangaroo courts because the uh, Boston bombing suspect, I saw that there's a, um article in InfoWars right now saying that his fate is going to be decided. Now, these courts, um, y- you have to think just how much are the judges in on the conspiracy and the juries too. I mean, anybody who saw what Dan Badani did with the Boston bombing knows that the whole thing is a fraud. And I mean, the whole underwear bomber thing with with Kurt Haskell and his testimony, he said that the judge in that trial, Nancy Edmonds, when he said this was no doubt a government conspiracy. She was giving him dirty looks as he was giving his victim statement. Interesting thing about the underwear bomber judge, she was actually nominated by um, George Herbert Walker Bush, and the day he nominated her was September 11th, 1991. <laughs> Same day as his uh-huh. New World Order speech. Go figure. What an interesting coincidence. Well, I think that discredits so. her right there, right? That right. automatically so, discredits anything she'll ever say. Right. So, um, um, But you have to wonder, these, these juries and these judges – are, are they actually in on this conspiracy, or, or are they just going along to get along, even though they know that what they're doing is flat out wrong? Well, it, it's been proven, um, and, and mostly in these systems where there uh, there was a, a judge at a juvenile court that was arrested eventually, because he was taking kickbacks. I think this is in Pennsylvania. He was getting kickbacks from the prison company where he was sending kids, many of which were innocent. Or do, and it didn't matter. He was sending them in because he got a kickback every time. And, you know, these judges are, are – We I think we ran a report a while back that they're almost like NASCAR drivers. They are sponsored. They're just – they're sponsored um, – they're sponsored authorities is what they are. And, yeah, I think our justice system is totally corrupt. And, you know, I, I go in for a, a speeding ticket, and I was able to get the cop uh, a few years ago, and I was able to get him to admit that he didn't – calibrate any of his stuff correctly and he hadn't done the certain range finding he didn't do any of these things that you're supposed to do because i went and read the manual which they wouldn't give to me i had to take photos of it coincidentally or interestingly enough and um you know i'm bringing all this information on at the end he's like well you know i guess i'm not sure if you were speeding and so did the judge dismiss the case no he just knocked the fine down a little bit it's like well you must be guilty because you're sitting here in you're in this you were brought here by one of my minions so you got to be guilty of something and, you know, you just spent 30 minutes of my time because at one point the judge said, can we get on with it? Because I was asking I was asking the guy question after question. You know, I didn't stop. I was leaving no stone unturned. I'm like, you know, if they're going to bring me up here, I'm going to be a pebble in the gears. I'm going to cause some consternation here, which is I think that's our duty 
to do and, and go in there, whether we win or lose in court. We should go in there and, and be a cog to slow the machine down just a little bit because that is our only hope of stopping um, this this system. But, yeah, I think judges are totally paid for. I think the pro- the defense in this case was, was you know, bought. she basically said in his first the first day of the trial he did it. You know, she, so she's not going to offer anything alternative. Underwear bomber, um, you know, that was one thing I covered heavily in uh, Police State for the rise of FEMA, which you can go watch for free on YouTube. Go to the underwear bomber section. We laid it all out back then, and I think right after we finished, uh, our, as like I think a day before I found the Patrick Kennedy uh, information, although I didn't find the video at the time, uh, where he actually admits that they got word from another government agency that they were tracking this guy and so to not detain him, not to stop him. Okay? That right there blows out your whole underwear bomber thing out the airlock and your body scanners and your Michael Chertoff kickbacks that, that happen. I mean, all that stuff should be investigated. But, it, you know, even that, which isn't even on the grand scheme of things, nobody died there, but now we're all having our civil liberties, you know, Quashed upon and groped literally by the TSA, so they we we never get to see, you know, justice done on those little instances, and that's all. Yeah, it's all controlled by the courts. I totally agree. Thank you very much, Rob. So um, I guess um, our one more time for one more question. The live feed will go off in three minutes fifty five seconds, but again, um, we can still talk for a little bit after that, even though listeners won't hear it. If you want to finish up, but uh, as far as what you see for the future of the truth movements um you see a alex jones always seems to say uh oh we're in so much trouble but many would say he's just trying to get publicity by fear-mongering but either way um do you think that we are really on a positive timeline and uh well that's the first part of my question and the second part do you think maybe people in the truth movement like should be willing to talk about more far out things that they wouldn't normally talk about like uh, like i gave the case of alex jones not wanting to talk about holographic planes because he thought it would discredit the truth movement and also the whole subjects of ufos and aliens many people will not go there because they fe- fear it's not worth uh, talking about because it would instantly discredit them um do you think that that's uh, more truthers should be willing to talk about that stuff in the um upcoming near future well you know, I think people should take their area of, of interest and expertise and let that guide them. And if you know, if you want to talk about UFOs and um, and also or another area, New Age religion or crystals or time travel, I think all this stuff's very interesting. And I think there's a lot of evidence for uh, you know alien contact uh, that we've had. But you know, uh, that's not where my interest lies. So I don't choose to spend my time talking about that. I you know play bass guitar. Not a lot of bass guitar players out there, you know, it's just, but that's where my interest lies in music. Um, so, you know, I think the great thing about the Internet is you can find five other people that are interested in whatever the hell you want to talk about, at least five, you know, if not more. And, you know, those people should get together and make their own documentaries, and people do do that. I think it's great. I, I think the people who came together and put that Let's Talk About Sandy Hook documentary, I think that's one of the greatest instances of people coming together through research and sharing their own ideas and theories and working together to come up with, you know, their, you know, in, in a collectivist sense, you know, they said, Hey, we're, we, if we pool our resources and come together, we can actually make something, you know, tangible that people are going to be talking about. And that scared so many damn people that, you know, it was, it was a fight with YouTube to even watch it. And I think that uh, speaks volumes for the information they were putting out. And it's information that I, I had read about. I didn't even know about Sandy Hook, and I, was, I thought I'd known a, a lot about it. But there's a ton of people out there talking about stuff like that. And, you know, some people don't want to touch Sandy Hook. You know, I'll, I'll go there and, with Sandy Hook and say I don't think it, what, what happened, you know, is really what happened. Not at all. I don't know if kids really died or not. Maybe there were, maybe there weren't. You know, I, I'm anxious to see what uh, Wolfgang Halbig gets out of these uh, – School board people, they seem to be stonewalling him. So obviously his questions have hit a nerve. So I think our job as as uh, truth seekers and truth tellers is to ask questions. And if we're not getting the answers that, that seem to go with the evidence, just to keep looking and to keep, you know, doing reports and writing articles. That's our that's our job here, at, you know, as quote-unquote truthers and i think you know that's truthers in anything so you know if ufos are your thing 
talk about UFOs. If um, you know, I, I once got onto a two day jag reading about John Tidor. You know, and the time traveler. That was I don't even know if people remember that, but that, that was a guy who claimed to be a time traveler. Um, that was in a long internet feed. Did you ever read about that guy, John Titor? I've heard the name, but I haven't read about it. And, um... Well, it, it'll take lots of uh, lots of minutes off your life, and I think it's interesting stuff. And I, and I believe if uh, there's a there's an old sign out there that says, "What do we want time travel? When do we want it? It's irrelevant." Irrelevant. Um, we already have time travel if we ever had it, or if we ever will have it. It's already here. So, um, I, th- I think, and I think that's uh, I myself have actually built a time machine. Believe it or not, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different discussion that we could get on later. But uh, you can right. find it at Art Outside uh, this year out in uh, Texas. If you want to come find the time machine and ride it, it's available to ride at any time during that festival. <laughs> Thanks. And since you mentioned Sandy Hook, just one thing I want to point out. The FBI reports sure. do say that nobody died at Sandy Hook. So I guess if the Sandy Hook conspiracy yeah. theorists do want to say nobody died, just make sure that you make reference to that FBI document. But then again, that's the government telling us that, and the government lies to us so much, we don't know if we can trust them even when they say nobody died at Sandy Hook. But you know what? I, I, I hear yeah. you there. Amen. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> But, and, of course, we lose the Second Amendment right to bear arms. We lose everything else because if they take the guns, right, they take right. everything. But that won't happen. Yeah. Don't worry about it because people are too awake and love their guns too much. But we have come to the end of this show, Rob. So um, I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell all of my guests. You are a fascinating individual, and I have no doubt that if I wanted to, I could do another show with you. But one of my goals with this radio show is to get as many different guests on my show as possible before giving any one specific guest double dips, because I fear that is feel that is the fairest, most impartial, and ultimately the most informative way of doing a radio show that seeks to expose the true and false nature of reality. So that does mean I probably will not be asking you to come on my show again, but please understand that's only because I need to give thousands of other fascinating individuals the chance to have some glory on my radio show. But this was a fascinating interview. I promise you I will I will upload this to YouTube, and I will make sure I spread this interview far and wide. And the information in this interview, some will say it's preaching to the choir. Other people will use it as a great wake-up tool. So um, either way, I'm sure it'll be worthwhile to society to – listen to your words of wisdom in this interview and I'll make sure it gets spread far and wide. I promise. I think that's a great philosophy. I wholeheartedly agree with it uh, because I, I tend to be a blowhard uh, myself. I can't believe we talked for two hours and doesn't even feel like two hours have gone by. So thanks for inviting me on and to everybody out there, you know, I, I just, if I could just add this one little bit, just seek the truth and uh, hopefully you will find it. And, um, you know, also enjoy life. Don't get so caught up in what's going on that you forget to live life because, you know, the people that were fighting the revolution are dead now, but we're living, you know, we're we're living through what they've done and we're continuing on their work, which, you know, I think we're, uh, which is built upon other people's great works, people who stood up against bullies and against tyrants. That's our job to do. And when people are lying to us, we need to expose that. So I'm, that's my mission in in life, and I'm and I'm all for it until they decide to take me to a FEMA camp, which I will not go willingly at all into the night. So uh, thanks for having me on. Totally appreciate it. And you have yourself a good night, and uh, and the rest of your uh, shows have a great series. So thanks for inviting me on. And good luck with the rest of the Infowars gang and you. All right, take care. All right, bye bye. Later. That's the end of this show, folks. Next week, I'm going to be having Peter Kling on. He has appeared many times on Alfred Weber's Exopolitics TV interviews uh, on Alfred Weber's YouTube channel. If any of you want to check that out, he's uh, done a lot of prophecy interviews um, and such. So Peter Kling will be my guest next week on uh, May 20th. So without further ado, namaste, everyone. This is Andrew Fisher signing off from Nature of Reality Radio. Enjoy the rest of your trek throughout infinite consciousness.